Welcome everyone to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, my name is Jess Nestory. I'm an Associate Professor of Politics and International Affairs here at Wake Forest University. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of qu quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake Forest University and also by Springer Publishing. This week's speaker, uh, excellently named Justin Grimmer of Stanford University, uh, giving a talk entitled, Naive Regression Requires Weaker Assumptions Than Factor Models to Adjust for Multiple Cause Confounding. I love when the title tells you everything you need to know. Uh, Justin's talk will last between 30 to 40 minutes, after which point we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window, and you can ask questions at any time, but we will hold all the questions till the end of the presentation. If you wish to be recognized and uh, talk uh, in audio with uh, Justin during the Q&A session, please indicate that in the Q&A text box. Otherwise, I will read your question aloud during the Q&A period. A link to the slides will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window, so you may refer to it throughout the presentation. And now I'd like to welcome Justin Grimmer to the IMC. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to present this work that is jo joint with uh, Dean Knox at Penn and Brandon Stewart at, at Princeton. And so this work really tackles a setting that I think is quite common across a number of empirical situations, both within the social sciences and outside of it. Here's the idea. You have a set of treatments, those are the A's, a big set of treatments, maybe multiple treatments, and those affect some outcome. But of course, we haven't been able to usually randomize those treatments. And so we might be worried about some shared confounder Z. And the question that motivates this talk, and indeed a lot of work across a number of fields, is if we can learn something about this underlying confounder Z because we have multiple treatments. And in fact, that's the goal of this idea of a deconfounder, which is the term given to this suite of methods by an influential paper from Wang and Bly, published in 2019. Here's the idea. The goal of the deconfounder is to estimate the effect of a set of causes, A, on some outcome, Y. And the key here is that there's multiple causes. There's perhaps a large set of causes. And we have one univariate outcome. And we want to know how those causes affect that outcome. Of course, the problem, as the graph showed, is that there's some unobserved multi-cause confounder that's lurking in the background. Of course, we might think that there's some that there are many of these confounders, and that's going to be important for what we describe later. But to get intuition, we can think that there's some shared confounder across all of these treatments. And so, what can we do? Well, in this uh, in this influential paper that formalizes practice across a number of fields, including genetics, the proposed solution is this idea called a deconfounder. The idea here is that first, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the dimensionality of A to obtain some estimate of that. Uh, of that confounder, what we might call the substitute confounder. Then the idea is that we're going to regress Y on both the treatments and this function of the treatments, the substitute confounder, in order to adjust for this lurking confounder, with the intuition being that perhaps these treatments share some of the imprint underneath this confounder. So just to see this again, we can get some intuition about why that might be the case. We might think that after we have repeatedly observed many A's, that there's going to be some shared variation that reflects what this that reflects this underlying confounder. But what, and what this is compared to is what is often called the traditional alternative. You might call it a naive baseline. And this naive baseline might say, well, let's just ignore the confounding in Z. And what we're going to do is simply regress Y on A. And this is, of course, we might think that this is flawed for all the reasons that we learned that this sort of research design is flawed in our first research, uh, uh, research methods course. This underlying confounding could uh, correlate both, both with the treatments and the outcome and as a result, pollute our inferences. And so Wang and Bly, in fact, use this as a baseline and call this a naive baseline. But what this talk shows is that in fact, this naive baseline is weakly superior to the deconfounder. In fact, the deconfounder is only consistent when a naive regression is consistent. And the deconfounder is only consistent because it contains information from the naive regression. The machinery of the deconfounder, this estimation of the substitute confounder, is completely superfluous. All the information is going to be in that naive regression. And so while this may sound like we're going to suggest some, some useful empirical practice, what we're going to show is that this requires extremely strong assumptions to get off the ground. 
So what are we going to do in this talk? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first establish that this is a widely used empirical practice. And then once we do that, we're going to analyze the many proposed deconfounder variants that are out there in the world. What we're going to call the full deconfounder and a range of other deconfounders. And what we're going to show is that some of these aren't in fact estimable. Others in order to estimate them require extra assumptions. And none are going to be consistent when naive regression is not. Naive regression is going to contain the information we're going to need to, to use that imprint of the confounder. Then these are all asymptotic results. So of course, we might be interested in what happens in, in a finite setting. So what we're going to do is we're going to replicate and extend a number of simulations and empirical applications of the deconfounder. And what we're going to find across these settings is that there's no evidence that the deconfounder consistently outperforms naive regression. And in fact, you can end up with results um, that look quite counterintuitive and are sort of uh, facially invalid by not taking seriously other measurable confounders and applying the deconfounder results. Okay, so, so first I'm going to establish to you that you should care about the deconfounder in this sort of practice. So this is a general strategy that's widely used. It's hugely influential in genetics and medicine, but it turns out it implicitly shows up in the study of social networks. And in fact, people who study legislative politics have been using the deconfounder for decades. Think about the deconfounder this way. If we have uh, an outcome, say an incumbent's vote share, and we're interested in the effect of a particular set of roll call votes on that incumbent's vote share, we may adjust for a DW nominate score that's based on those roll call votes. But that's exactly what the deconfounder is doing. So it turns out Congress literature has been ahead of the game deconfounding for quite some time. So the assumptions that underlying the deconfounder have been under some contention, but there's really four key consumptions and these are quite strong. The ones that I wanna to highlight to you are first, that there's no confounders that affect only one treatment or no single cause confounders. And this third assumption, which is called pinpointing, which basically says in the theory of the deconfounder that we can substitute the confounder with the substitute confounder, that they're, that not that the substitute confounder is a consistent estimator for the true confounder, but that they are one in the same, that they, that they are the same values. Um, of course, if this assumption holds, there's a problem. And in fact, you can distill down all of the results into our talk into the, into the following uh, logical uh, argument. We know that the substitute confounder is merely a function of the treatments, right? So we're gonna use the treatments that are available. We'll apply some factor analysis to them and we'll use that to estimate the substitute confounder. The D confounder is gonna adjust for that substitute confounder. So we're gonna learn this conditional expectation, conditional on the treatments and um, the substitute confounder. But of course the substitute confounder is just a function of the treatments. And so as a result of that, this conditional expectation reduces just to Y on uh, the set of, of treatments. Of course, this could require some uh, semi-parametric functional form and we'll extend results to that in this talk. But this shows the sort of general reason why the deconfounder is not gonna be particularly useful. Um, there is a whole bunch of prior work that has engaged with the uh, Wang and Bly. And so a number of these papers make some really important contributions. So Alex Dealmore shows that uh, it's impossible to do non-parametric identification, that the deconfounder is going to require an infinite number of treatments. Um, and the other work has shown uh, that there's either some unstated assumptions or that there's some key distinctions that need to be made between the substitute confounder and the true confounder that uh, make the theory uh, uh, that challenge various theoretical claims made in the original wing and block. But all of this prior research focuses entirely on theory. And so one might walk away from their paper thinking that while there could be some theoretical disputes, we might believe that the empirical practice, we've demonstrated that this works and therefore perhaps there's something to the Deacon founder. And so what we're gonna do in this work is really focus in on these estimation issues and focus in on the applications. And what we're gonna show is that there's little evidence that the Deacon founder is gonna be helpful. So what are the, we're now eight minutes in, I'm gonna give you the key takeaways from this talk. So we have some theoretical contributions in, in the paper. So the first thing we're gonna show is that under some very strong assumptions, there's some intuition that the deconfounder-like results could, could be correct. The observed treatments do in fact contain information about these unobserved confounders. And we show that you can in fact have deconfounders 
that are consistent without explicitly conditioning on these unobserved uh, confounders. And so this is, we think, perhaps conceptually interesting. Um, uh, but in practice, this is useless for applied research. Why is this? Well, first, it requires infinite dimensional treatments. That is, you need, in, you need asymptotics, not just in the number of observations. You need asymptotics in the number of treatments. And that's going to be, obviously, a strong assumption. Assumption. There's a whole bunch of extra assumptions that are going to be built in that are never satisfied in, in real data. And what's more, if they are satisfied, you could just do a simple semi-parametric regression to capture all of the benefits of the deconfounder. So there's no sense in which this deconfounder approach of using these factor models is going to be useful. You could just use the classic machinery of a semi-parametric regression. Okay, so the sort of plan of attack for the theory portion of this talk is that I'm going to show you the deconfounder first in a what we'll call a toy setting. This is what we're going to be what we call linear linear setting, linear in the outcome, linear confounding related to the treatments, and then we're going to generalize that to give some intuition to this non to the um, more general non-parametric and semi-parametric settings. Okay, so what is this simplified intuition? So here's what we're going to suppose. We have some data generating process. Again, if you want to anchor intuition and you're like me, you, you know, pay the bills in part by studying Congress, you could think that you have some underlying characteristics of individuals, perhaps their conservatism. That's like one confounder. Uh, and we're going to draw that from a multivariate normal distribution or a normal distribution for each of the observations. And then what we're going to suppose, um, if we have those K confounders, we're going to have M, which is greater than equal to K observed treatments. And those observed treatments are uh, dependent upon these confounders. And the extent to which they're dependent on the confounders is governed by theta, right? So theta is going to tell us the extent of the confounding. If theta were zero, there would be no confounding. This would just be error added to A. Uh, it, as theta gets stronger, you can think about the relationship between Z and A getting stronger. The confounding gets greater. It turns out that's going to play a big role uh, for our theory. And then what we'll suppose is that there's some scalar outcome. And this outcome is a function of both the treatments and the treatment effects in this very, very uh, stylized setting. It's just going to be those coefficients beta. But then it's also confounded by the same underlying confounder, z. So we're going to suppose throughout that we have finite coefficients and non-zero variances. So the setting's interesting. And we're going to examine some proposed estimators in this toy setting, and then, as I said, generalize. And so one key result is that no estimator that we consider is going to be consistent for any data generating process when you only have a finite number of treatments. That is, even if you had an infinite number of observations, it will only be consistent if you also grow the number of treatments. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to examine some asymptotics for sequences of data generating processes where we're going to hold the number of confounders fixed, and then we're going to increase the number of treatments. So by that, we mean if we're going to grow new treatments, we'll mean that we'll add some uh, extra uh, confounding vector theta, and then we'll add some treatment effect, some, some beta. And these stars will indicate that we've grown our, our data generating process. And so then we're going to ask some basic questions like, is our estimator asymptotically consistent? That is, as we get infinite number of observations, is it going to uh, collapse on the truth? And what we show in our paper is that in, even in this setting, you need uh, to get asymptotic consistency, you need a very strong condition. And this very strong condition is called strong infinite confounding. And so you can define it like such. All the diagonal elements of theta theta prime go to infinity. And what we can think about this is that the diagonal of theta theta prime describes how confounded a particular observation is uh, uh, by uh, the underlying z. So it's sort of counterintuitive here. But we say in order for this approach to work, you need your treatments to reach a particular level of confounding. And the reason for this is that we need to use the treatments to adjust for the, this background confounder. And we can only learn enough about that background confounder if this strong infinite confounding condition holds. And so uh, this is obviously a strong condition, and it uh, overturns some of the statements about this result, where it was previously suggested you only needed 
at least every confounder to affect at least two treatments, when in fact, not only do you need every confounder to affect an infinite number of treatments, it must be the case that it affects those treatments enough that we can learn about that, that confounding. We have counterexamples in the paper where a confounder can affect an infinite number of treatments and yet still be inconsistent. We have a more general case of this I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. Um, uh, we we're going to uh, define something as naive, as an estimator that only uses A, ignoring the existence of the unobserved Z, doesn't try to explicitly go out there and estimate a, a substitute confounder. So for the linear linear case, we have the obvious um, naive regression we might want to run, which is ordinary least squares. We all know the OLS formula. The asymptotic bias in this setting is going to be what looks like the omitted variable formula plus some schmearing from having the infinite number of treatments or the large number of treatments, the loadings. And so as treatments grow large, one thing that we show in our paper is that the naive regression is a consistent estimator. That is, it, it's, it, it collapses on the truth. And the reason it's able to do this is because it, it's learning enough about these underlying components to adjust for that, that confounding. Okay, so that suggests that naive regression is a strong baseline. So let's compare this to some of these results, um, that, some of the deconfounders that have been proposed by Wing and Bly or used uh, across literatures. So one, we might call the full deconfounder. And the full deconfounder goes something like this. We're gonna obtain the substitute uh, confounder by doing an SVD and we're going to pick off the uh, first K components of this SVD to estimate the underlying substitute confounder. This is uh, actually sort of conditions on the data journey process. This is the correct substitute confounder you'd want to want to extract given this data journey process. So then the full D confounder would estimate something like this, where you're going to estimate both the regression coefficients on A and attempt to estimate the gamma coefficients on the substitute confounder to adjust for that confounding. But of course, for those of you following along at home, you can see very quickly, this is not estimable. We can't estimate this thing, even though it was proposed in this original paper. And that's because the substitute confounder is really just a linear transform of A. So there's no new information here. This is, this is not in fact estimable. Um, there's a bunch of ad hoc fixes for this issue that we analyze in our paper. And none of them add information where you're going to get something different than the naive regression. And in fact, the performance of those, the rates of their performance is often worse. As an alternative approach, we might suggest using the subset deconfounder. So here, this is going to, this is going to render the deconfounder estimable. And this is going to be quite similar to what's done across a number of genetics settings. Here, the idea is to obtain that substitute confounder just as before. You're going to do that principal component analysis of the treatments. And then we're going to divide A into two sets. So one set we're going to call the focal treatments. These are the treatments that we're interested in. And we're going to suppose uh, that this set is fixed when we're thinking about these asymptotic results. And of course, this focal treatments will have some confounding and have some coefficients. And then we're going to have a set of non-focal treatments. And of course, those will also have some confounding and some coefficients. And we're going to grow these non-focal treatments. And the idea here is that we'll do this growing in service of trying to estimate the causal effect of the focal treatments. That's why they're focal. We're interested in learning their effect. So instead of doing the full deconfounder, instead we might estimate the substitute deconfounder. We use all the treatments to estimate that, um, the subset deconfounder. We use all the treatments to estimate the substitute confounder and then only estimate the effect of the focal treatments. Of course, now we've, we've broken that perfect collinearity. So this is in fact estimable, but there's a problem with this approach as well. That's gonna result in requiring stronger assumptions than even naive regression. And that is there's omitted variable bias from excluding uh, those non-focal treatments from this regression. If you knew Z, this isn't a problem, right? Because if you adjust for Z, the non-focal and focal treatments are conditionally independent by our data journey process. But because we're working with Z hat, we can't render them perfectly um, uh, uh, ignorable, render them perfectly independent. And as a result, this omitted variable, bi omitted variable bias creeps in. And what we show in the paper is that this sort of method results in a race as you add more AN. Um, uh, as you add more AN, the uh, omitted variable bias um, 
from each non-focal treatment will decline because we're going to get a better estimate of that underlying confounder. And so any one non-focal treatments uh, confounding will go down. But as you add more non-focal treatments, the sum total of that, of that confounding can either stay the same or even in some instances get worse. And as a result of that, we're going to need additional conditions for the subset deconfounder to be consistent. And so we can get a, what looks like a messy form uh, for what this asymptotic bias looks like. Um, we can then show conditions under which this will be consistent. Um, but this requires some extremely strong additional assumptions. So first, if the focal treatments are randomly assigned, you're golden. But if the focal treatments are randomly assigned, you're in the wrong talk because you, uh, you can just analyze it as an experiment. Another one is that there could be some accidental omitted variable bias cancellation. So if the uh, confounding and the betas cancel out such that they're uh, equal to zero asymptotically in the number of treatments, um, then, then you will have, uh, uh, then you will have um, a consistent estimator. And then finally, uh, it could be the case that you have strong infinite confounding, just like you had before as well. And the key then is that these later treatments have to have ever weakening effects. And so what's going on here is that asymptotically, as you add more treatments, this will work if the treatments you add are converging onto proxies. And by proxies, we mean things that are correlated with the confounder but don't affect the outcome. And of course, there's this big literature, an important literature on using proxies in, in this sort of setting. And so if asymptotically your treatments converging on proxies, then you are able to get the subset deconfounder to be consistent. In the absence of these conditions, though, the naive regression will be consistent in these settings, but the subset deconfounder won't. And in our paper, we have some asymptotics um, about these settings. And uh, the key here with all these assumptions is that they're, they're very strong and about the phenomena under study. So for example, you have to believe that you're able to add a bunch of treatments that don't affect your outcome in order to uh, make the subset deconfounder work, which, which might be a strong condition. Um, these sorts of other ad hoc uh, versions of the deconfounder also don't work, uh, uh, don't do anything that the naive regression doesn't. And what we show in the paper is because they nest naive regression. Okay, so I'm going to uh, relatively quickly go through the generalization of this. So if you get some intuition from what we just said there, it turns out that intu intuition is going to port into more general settings. Um, and so to get some intuition for why this might be the case, let's consider uh, a, a very simple uh, conditional expectation setting, but now we, have, we allow the confounding to be nonlinear, but the effect of the A's continues to be linear. So this is this sort of semi-parametric setting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna expand out, uh, do a polynomial expansion of this, just to get a sense of what the confounding will look like. Um, we're going to do is uh, we'll take, do the same thing we did before, and we'll uh, take the SVD of A, and we're going to compute some higher order uh, uh, W hats. And then we're going to run a ridge regression on the A's, the substitute confounders that we had before, and then these W hats, the, the, um, uh, the higher order polynomials. And what we find is that these higher order polynomials don't contaminate beta, perhaps not surprisingly, but the linear trend does. And so the key problem here in this very informal analysis is that the linear, that the deconfounder can't distinguish between linear causal effects and the linear part, linear part of nonlinear confounding. Uh, and that becomes the problem with the, the deconfounder in these settings. Okay. Um, so we have a sort of general theorem about the relationship between the deconfounder and the, the naive. Um, and so this is uh, the key theorem one from our paper. So we're, suppose we're in the following data joining process setting. Uh, our treatments are drawn from some continuous density factor model. And the Zs are pinpointable. That is, we're in a setting where the original paper argues that the deconfounder could be useful. And what's more, we're going to suppose that we have separable causal effects, but they can be nonlinear. That is, the, A, the treatments are uh, separable from each other and from the confounding, and the uh, confounding itself is nonlinear. Then in this setting, any consistent deconfounder converges to a naive estimator for any finite subset of, tre subset of treatment effects. That is, 
the deacon founder is merely going to give you the same information as a, a naive regression. So um, how does this work? So some very quick intuition of this before we get into the empirics. Let's poke, uh, uh, partition our treatments into focal and non-focal. And the pinpointing implies that we can invert um, the function on the treatments in order to get the um, confounder exactly. Um, so uh, this means that we can, again, do this inversion with just the non-focal treatments, again, because of the pinpointing. If we have a finite subset of treatments, then that won't affect the fact that we can pinpoint on the, the non-focal treatments. And the result of this, just substituting this in, we realize that uh, by, by substituting in the, these exact uh, uh, values, that the original conditional expectation is again, just a function of the focal treatments we care about. And then we can use uh, the non-focal treatments to do the adjustment. And you can just do that in a, a, a non-parametric or semi-parametric regression. Okay. So that's a lot of theory about this. So let's look at some empirical evidence about what's going on here to get some intuition about what's happening. And so one place where you can get a lot of intuition of this is happening comes from a tutorial that was produced to, to bolster the results of the um, original Wang and Bly paper. So the simulation, so the data drawing process here is one that looks like the linear linear. They're gonna draw Z, A, Zs and As from a multivariate normal. And that row is gonna govern the correlation between the Zs and the As. And we're just gonna suppose the same correlation throughout. Uh, but then what uh, they do in the simulation uh, from Wang and Bly is they square the treatments and square uh, the confounding. And they ask how well can the deconfounder perform in this setting? Um, so, so what do they do? So they, they go back and use the unsquared treatments to obtain the substitute confounder. And then they regress Y on the, the squared treatments and then the squared substitute confounder. And so the first naive estimator that we might do, linear approximation, I guess is just ignore the substitute confounder and just look at these squared terms. And so that's what's going on here. Here we're looking at the average root mean squared error and the results that they report is it looks like the deconfounder does much better than this naive linear approximation uh, by using this, this squared information, okay? But um, if we look more generally across the space, what can we find? Uh, we find that in fact, the deconfounder can perform much worse than this naive linear approximation. Um, and what's going on here is that the, the behavior just depends a great deal on what this, this correlation is. Um, but we can actually do better. So if you sort of take this simulation very seriously, you can exploit the parametric form to get the correct naive estimator. So if you know enough um, to do the squaring and to extract out the substitute confounder like they've done, if you're an analyst in that position, you know enough, in fact, to use the multivariate normal simulation procedure in order to get the exact parametric form. And if you do this, uh, in this setting, you can see that um, uh, our uh, 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 naive linear, uh, the, sorry, the naive approximations do much better than the deconfounder, which does really poorly when the correlations become negative. Okay, so that's a simulation. So you might say, okay, fine, the deconfounder does poorly in this setting. Uh, when you go beyond the particular settings that they've used, let's like let's see this in like an actual case. All right, so the key uh, application in this original Wang and Bly paper is the causal effect of actors on movie revenues. This is sort of a fun application. Um, so let's suppose that uh, movie revenue is a function of a bunch of stuff. What's the stuff? So you might think it's a function of the actors that appear. So like some actors may cause a movie to make more money. And of course, uh, there's a whole set of confounders we might be worried about like genre, uh, budget not related to movie, not related to the actors, director, um, uh, stuff like this. Uh, is, is there a global pandemic happening? Although all this stuff is, is pre-pandemic, of course. Um, so we might ask then what actors, which actors causally increase revenue the most? You imagine if you're a studio head, this is a question you want to know the answer to. Um, we're going to stipulate to a bunch of stuff that goes on in this example. I think that for a bunch of reasons, we might be concerned about uh, the sort of causal design here. But nevertheless, let's stipulate to this idea that what we can do is use the deconfounder in order to analyze the effect of particular actors. Um, 
And so what do Wang and Bly do? Well, they run the following analysis. They assume that they're interested in looking at the log of the uh, movie returns, the movie revenue. And then to estimate the substitute confounder, they use a technique called a Poisson matrix factorization, sort of a standard off the shelf method from um, machine learning. It, uh, they apply that to the matrix of treatments and then they run some OLS. And then so we can think about the uh, coefficients then as like the multiplicative causal effect on revenue, sort of standard interpretation of uh, coefficients with a log outcome. Okay, so in red are the, uh, this is the estimates just from the cached uh, estimates from the Wang and Bly code. In red are the act are two of the actors that were presented. And then the remaining, uh, you can see our other actors, just if we ordered it like they did. So they said, okay, here are, some top actors as, as they described. So we just looked here at the actors that they identified as having the biggest effect. And immediately something jumps out at you. If you are a Marvel comic books fan like me or a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you notice that the top actor according to this analysis is Stan Lee. Uh, Stan Lee, of course, the uh, person who created uh, many of the Marvel comic heroes and the longtime owner of Marvel comics. Uh, you may remember him from appearances such as this. So this is one example of Stanley's contribution to a movie. Here he's uh, uh, attempting to extract Thor's hammer uh, unsuccessfully, of course. And he asks, did it work? Um, uh, and so the estimate from the full deconfounder would suggest that Stanley's appearances increased revenue uh, eight times and by our calculations contributed something like $15.5 billion in total revenue to both the Marvel Cinematic Universe and actually his longest appearance is in the uh, 90s cult classic Mallrats um, where he, he has uh, nearly a full minute of screen time. But of course the uh, Deacon founder identifies another a number of other implausible actors that seemingly contribute lots of movie revenue. Uh, so John Ratzenberger, for example, is a voice actor and supposedly increased revenue by seven times. And, and why is this? Well, he appears in every Pixar movie. Um, we can do, uh, while they use the full deconfounder, we can use a subset deconfounder um, in order to estimate this. And we arrive at some similarly problematic results. Um, so the biggest actor you can see here is this, this guy, Jess Harnell, who um, has such a big estimate because he appears as Ironside in the movie Transformers, uh, but also in some, some animated films. Um, other folks like child actor Ava Akers increases revenue by, um, by nine times. And what's going on here is that these estimates, I think, are obviously confounded by genre, studio, and the film franchise. And so we're not doing enough to adjust for the fact that Stan Lee happens to appear in some of the most successful movies ever. And those are the only appearances that he makes. It's not like Stan Lee is going out and doing an art house film where he meditates on the nature of father-son relationships. He's only appearing briefly in Marvel, in Marvel uh, movies. And what's this suggest, at least to us, is that this strong infinite confounding condition, which needs to be satisfied for this method to get off the ground, is difficult to satisfy even approximately so that these sorts of methods are useful. And in fact, just as some evidence for that, not that we want to, you know, bet our house on the on this final column, but if you just adjust for budget, you get perhaps a more plausible set of answers. So if you adjust for budget, you find that, find that the top um, revenue contributing actor is Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, recent winner of the Golden Globe for the Borat sequel, obviously highbrow. Um, and, and a reasonable case can be made that he contributes a lot of revenue. Of course, there's lots of other problems with this sort of analysis, but nevertheless, it would appear that adjusting for budget, the quintessential con, uh, uh, shared confounder, the deconfounder should identify, um, renders very different results. Okay, so what do we learn from this? Um, the first big thing here is that the deconfounder machinery is superfluous. You don't need it. Um, no proposed deconfounder estimator achieves consistency where naive regression does not. And what's more is that this idea that we can use many treatments in order to adjust for some shared confounding, we, we think that this is generally problematic because the methods are inconsistent with a finite number of treatments. And what's more, 
the seeming improvement in finite sample performance that's documented in Wang and Bly and in some other papers is illusory. It is, it, it is not actually there once we explore these simulations and empirical examples and look at the full space of results. And so in the paper, what you can see is we spent an incredible amount of time replicating every simulation and empirical study. And in order to do this, we made a number of improvements to estimation and evaluation, stabilized a bunch of issues that were there and looked across a wide range of parameter space. And once we do that, we find no evidence that the deconfounder is outperforming a naive regression. And what's more, you might think that the deconfounder might be helpful because it could help you with a functional form decision that could be difficult in a semi-parametric setting, either because you don't know how to specify it or because it could be data intensive for a semi-parametric regression. But what we show in the paper is in fact, even in settings that are advantageous to the deconfounder, it is simply unable to identify uh, uh, functional forms in settings where the functional form is not given. That is using off the shelf methods that are recommended in order to fit these substitute confounders we fail to find evidence that these off-the-shelf methods that are flexible estimators for the substitute confounder do a good job at that task. Um, and so, so the key lesson here, even though I think we have this interesting result that you can use these many treatments in order, order to adjust for this uh, substitute confounder, it requires such strong assumptions uh, that really what we're left saying is that uh, having many treatments is no substitute for a good research design in order to make credible causal inferences when you have multiple treatments. Uh, so with that, thank you. We have uh, uh, the full paper up with, with a ton more information and I'd love to hear your questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Justin, for that presentation. Uh, at this point, uh, Justin is available to take questions from the audience, and you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. Uh, if you want to be recognized and ask your question uh, via audio, uh, just indicate that in, uh, your, um, uh, uh, in your question in the Q&A box. Otherwise, I will read it aloud. Um, so while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, I just want to start uh, by asking... Um, you know, I, as a, um, as a political methodologist, uh, I have not seen this technique widely used in political science, at least up to this point, maybe I'm reading the wrong journals. Um, but, uh, I haven't seen it, uh, uh, particularly widespread. So, um, given that at least one potential audience of this paper is political methodologists and, and political scientists more generally, are you uh, just telling us, you know, not to drink from the poison chalice, or is there is this started to gain traction in political science? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so certainly, the big place where this is being used is uh, genetics, medicine, and then with some recommendation systems. So I, I know Netflix was was sort of thinking about using some of this, mm -hmm. um, and so that was you know part of the motivation for engaging in this work is that it sort of appearing in grant applications at various important health agencies. Hmm. Um, I was, I also hadn't heard much about this um, until someone suggested in an R and R that we use the technique hmm. um, in order to adjust for uh, confounding. And, and so uh, that's actually how I, I like sort of happened upon this and, and sort of got and dove into the, the project. Um, so we uh, sort of working through the R and R Referee says to do something. I'm like, yes, of course. Go look this up. Mm -hmm. Code up the um, put up the uh, like the how it would be applied to this particular problem, and it, it was not estimating. And it took me a moment to realize the full deconfounder problem, which was a, a an issue that had come up in some theoretical debates. That the uh, the core um, recommended algorithm from the paper actually isn't estimable. And so then once we've done that, and because this had been getting steam in these other fields, we, we the three of us sort of uh, I think got a little bit of a bee in our bonnet about it and uh, decided to, to, to dive head in. So I, I would agree that this is not a good idea for political methodologists. It does suggest to us uh, both that the um, you know, settings where we're using something like DW nominate to do an adjustment and you're interested in the effect of a roll call vote, it does suggest that you're doing something interesting there that perhaps we hadn't appreciated before mm -hmm. where you're adjusting um, 
for anything that's going to sort of or attempting to adjust for anything that's going to be correlated with the, the underlying votes. Um, of course, there's all these other assumptions about the votes not affecting each other, which could be difficult to sustain. But nevertheless, I think it's been around in political methodology in a way that we just hadn't appreciated. Yeah, I, I also think about the, you know, basically the assumption that there's no strategic voting, um, which, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. um, I, I want to, that was kind of a, an unhelpful question. Let me try to ask a more productive question. Um, is there a way of maybe making this uh, work? And let me, let me describe what I'm thinking. So uh, trying to get something for nothing, right? You have a bunch of treatments and you're going to, you know, magic up the, the, uh, the confounders, uh, maybe that's not going to work, but maybe you have um, a partially observed uh, set of confounders. Um, so you have a subset of Z, uh, or you have um, yeah. you have missingness both in observations and also in variables, right? So um, some observations have missing mm -hmm. Zs, and also some of the Zs are missing. Um, it strikes me that maybe that would be enough information. In other words, you'd be adding more information to the problem in a way. Uh, that would improve upon what, so what I would do sort of out of habit would be, okay, I use multiple imputation on the Z's that I have. Uh, and then the ones yep. that I don't, you know, well, that's life. Um, and uh, maybe this could do better. Is there, do you have any uh, insight on that front? Yeah. So there's a, one way to think about what's going on here is that this is like an unsupervised deconfounder in the sense that we don't know what the relationship to the treatments and the confounder are. So we're just using a factor model and hoping to get it. So if you observe some of the Z's on a subset, so like you run a survey and then you have a voter file, um, then you should be able to do better by modeling uh, those, those uh, coefficients using the data. Although um, uh, to one former student, one current student, uh, Christian Fong and Matt Tyler have a paper forthcoming at PA I think that they're more negative on how much you can learn by using that auxiliary sample. But certainly you can mm. estimate the substitute confounder better if you observe the substitute confounder and you can make the assumption that um, the relationship that you observe between in that subset is the same as in the full sample. You can right. come up with a, a much better estimate. Yeah. You're still going to have to make assumptions. Um, there's no substitute for that, but oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, but at least it might, yeah. you know, you, you think about the alternatives, right? It might be better than the next best thing we can do, which is uh, either nothing if we don't have disease at all, uh, or that's that subset of disease, yeah, or um, you know mice or some other mi to to impute for the missing observations. Um, okay. Well, okay. So uh, a question from the audience came in from Anthony Fowler. Uh, can you talk through yeah. the legislative politics example? Uh, there are lots of examples yeah. where someone includes a nominate score as an independent variable in a regression, probably thousands at this point. But I can't think of a case where someone pretended that this magically accounted for unobserved confounders. Magic is apparently the secret word today. Yeah. Um, sure. I, I I didn't mean to um, uh, impugn a whole literature there. Um, so uh, what I, <laughs> I don't think I don't think is, you did. Um, uh, so what I meant there is that um, uh, someone may use uh, uh, the deconfounder to estimate the sort of like shared confounding that went into the other, the determinants of the other votes. And so certainly they use this as a way to adjust for conservatism in the regression. If they say like, I wanna know about your vote on this like trade policy and how that affected your electoral returns. So then I use the deconfounder, or sorry, the factor model of the votes as a stand-in for conservatism. And that's the substitute, or that's the confounder that they think are driving those treatments. Um, so I don't think anyone is saying that that magically solves all the problems, so although it is uh, meant to stand in for uh, confounders that are driving the, the treatments. And then in that setting, my key point just is that the algorithm has this structure that's very similar to what's going on in like the genetics world. I mean, my thought about that was that um, I don't think of DW nominate as a... Um, uh, an unsupervised learning problem. I think of it as a as a strict, rather strict theoretical model based on you know spatial proximity voting, and then trying mm -hmm. to extract information assuming that model is true. Um, so if you knew the structure of the of that model, I think what you would say is you could actually build a, a some sort of SEM that would somehow incorporate the relationships in the votes and then estimate the 
basically estimate the denominate problem and your applied problem at the same time. If you already know that structure, you could already do that. Would that I'm extrapolating from your talk, but that seems uh, like a consequence of the argument. Yeah, I think that um, uh, I have to think a little bit more about how much the structure is buying you in, in that setting. But I think that one our point would just be um, provided that you have enough like if you have enough outcome data, for sure, you could just include the votes on the right hand side without worrying about the um, without worrying about what that that structure is. If you know the structure, you can do better by conditioning on it. We think it's unlikely you know the structure. So if uh, you can just include the votes on the right hand side, perhaps flexibly, and if you have enough observations, which is the consistency results, then um, you wouldn't need to, to sort of like worry about setting up the, the SEM. Or like there wouldn't you wouldn't see many benefits from it. Yeah, I mean you get an incidental parameters problem, right? Because there are ten zillion votes every congressional session, um, so the structure sort of gets you out of that. Yeah, so that's uh, I didn't talk about it here, but you have to set up the asymptotic regime to, you know, you need the n to grow uh, at a faster rate than m, and then that usually yeah. deals with the incidental parameters. I mean, I guess you you could argue. Would it be fair to argue, sort of extending Anthony's question a bit? Um, if I knew with certainty the relationship between uh, the unobserved Zs and the As, don't think about how I know that. Somehow I just know it. Then I could set up a structural model which would actually perform very well, right? Because I could estimate the Zs based on relationships in the As conditional on a known structure, Yeah, so we, we set up some simulations like this. Um, so so first off, like the linear linear setup is exactly this this situation where you know the the structure. So there was like conditional on knowing how to do the right factor model, and there it's either inestimable, unestimable, like that's the fool, or the subset requires the additional assumptions. Then you might say, okay, like let's look at a nonlinear setting. So we have some simulations where you know the functional form for this nonlinear setting, and uh, we don't see performance gains there. And in, and in fact, in some settings, the naive is just outperforming, even knowing that that information is just not particularly helpful. Hmm. And and what's the reason for that? So we had this like you know brief slide up there. I had this brief slide up there where. Uh, we see that the you know the higher dimensional confounding is because it's often assuming that there's just these linear effects. The high dimensional confounding is only going through the uh, the linear component of that high dimensional confounding. So knowing that extra functional form information turns out to be not as helpful as we might think hmm. in this like very stylized setting. Uh, well, I don't see any other questions from the audience, uh, so I'm going to end a little bit early today. I want to thank uh, everyone for being here and thank Justin for giving uh, uh, that presentation. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the presentation will be posted to our website shortly after the broadcast if you'd like to share it with a colleague or watch it again later. I also want to uh, 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 tell you about next week's talk, March 5th. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. not that Today is March 5th. Uh, what is it? Uh, March 12th. Uh, when we will host a talk by uh, Magdalena Bennett of UT Austin Macomb School of Business. She's giving a talk entitled, How Far is Too Far? Estimation of an Interval for a Generalization of a Regression Discontinuity Away from the Cutoff. Please see our website, uh, www.methods-colloquium.com, to get more information about this talk. Justin, thanks for being here today. Thank you. And I hope to see everyone next week.